What we're seeing, uh, you know, is a betrayal of uh, British Columbians and, and uh, Canadians and the values we place on wild fish. It's like a grand experiment gone horribly wrong. Fish farms are killing off wild salmon. The story of salmon farming is a sad saga of government denial and obstruction, of history repeating itself in country after country with disastrous economic, social, and ecological consequences. It's a story that continues to unfold despite a growing mountain of science telling us that we should know and act better. It's the story of a predictable collapse of one of the world's last natural abundances, wild salmon. The salmon farming story is one in need of a much happier ending. The independent scientific community speaks with a single voice on this issue, that industrial scale salmon farms in British Columbia are indisputably linked to the decline of wild salmon populations, full stop. If the fish farmers want to uh, play the same game the cigarette manufacturers did for many years and live in denial, they're welcome to it, but it's not going to give rise to any solutions. Sea lice and other impacts from salmon farms clogging coastal waters around the world have already taken a heavy toll on wild salmon. And wherever wild salmon have slipped away, there are governments and companies going to great lengths to avoid doing things the right way. I would blame governments and the way governments and industry behave in this, this interlocked, handmaiden relationship, if you like. The disastrous impacts of salmon farming have been reported in all areas where the industry operates. We've got a serious decline in salmon stocks in the area, which we attribute largely to uh, sea lice that comes from the fish farms. We have an unknown measure of impact uh, far field effects, incremental impacts that that has on other resources such as clams. We recently talked to some of Canada's top fishery scientists who have studied and published extensively on the harm salmon farms pose to wild fish. If there's an overarching message, it's one of incredible denial of published science and the scientific process. This denial has defined the battle lines to save wild salmon and the coastal communities that depend upon it. And saving the salmon also means looking after the bears, eagles, whales, the forests that are essential for fighting climate change, and historic indigenous culture at whose heart the salmon lies. Wild salmon are literally the heart and sustenance of some of the last great wild places on the planet, but for how long? If the salmon disappear along our coastline or are greatly diminished, we're going to see a tremendous loss of many of our icon species, such as the grizzly bear and the eagle. What we're seeing is a massive fortification of denial, obfuscation, uh, you know, misdirection, and uh, it's being funded by the federal government and the provincial government. And uh, you know, British Columbians are getting darn angry about what's happening here. Despite the well-worn denials from government and industry, the impacts of open cage salmon farming on wild salmon are well documented and straightforward. The foremost of these is the infestation of young salmon smolts by sea lice from the farms. While sea lice are a naturally occurring parasite in the open ocean, fish farms act as breeding grounds for lice, greatly magnifying parasite impacts in coastal waters. Myriad salmon farms are often placed in the same sheltered inlets through which the baby salmon migrate to rearing areas and the open ocean. Smolts invariably become infested by the lice, and the consequences are devastating. Here we are in front of a fish farm in Bedwell Inlet in the back of Clackwood Sound. This is one of six fish farms that the salmon smolts, when they emerge from the rivers in the springtime, would have to pass by in order to reach the open sea. When they run into a louse, um, it, it is a huge organism compared to them. This is a, this is a comparison to, to you having a 40-pound parasite chewing through your back. The science has, has largely been known for decades. Uh, the European experience, uh, which has been going on much longer uh, with salmon farms than it has in North America, um, they've dealt with all of these issues. And so, um, you know, it, it was predicted that we would be dealing with exactly the same issues if we tried to mimic their industry. Few scientists have studied salmon farming in greater depth than Alexandra Morton from a research station in the Broughton Archipelago, British Columbia, home to more farms than anywhere on Canada's coast. The epicenter 
of a worldwide problem. In 1987, the first fish farm showed up. I thought, yeah, good idea. I thought it would bring more kids for the school. I looked forward to there being farms out on the water for me to pull into if there was a storm. And uh, I thought it would take pressure off the wild salmon. But within a few years, we had epidemics that occurred in the fish farms and then appeared in our hatchery coho. Uh, we had marine mammals being shot. We had uh, algae blooms, water turning brilliant orange and red. And then in 1991, they displaced the killer whales with uh, loud sound producing devices. Morton and other top scientists began researching the interactions of salmon farms and wild salmon. The sea lice epidemic in British Columbia was initially documented on pink salmon, a very small salmon species. However, as the most abundant species, pinks are a linchpin for the whole ecosystem. And the problems caused by fish farms don't stop just at the pinks. Recently, one of the world's greatest salmon runs, the mighty Fraser River sockeye, has shown disturbing signs of sea lice infestation. This is not just a, a, you know, a problem confined to the Broughton Archipelago or Clackwood Sound or something like that. We now see lice on, on Fraser sockeye and probably other species of salmon from the Fraser. And the troubling thing is we don't know what the impacts are. We don't know how prevalent this is. Uh, we don't think that uh, you know, it really is registered on the radar of fisheries and oceans at this time. It was seen in the Broughtons a few years ago when pink salmon went from millions of fish to a collapse of uh, where we'd only have a few hundred thousand in those systems. In fact, a DFO scientist said never in the history of uh, pink salmon along the west coast in recorded history have we seen such a catastrophic collapse. And then he added saying that the epicenter of that collapse happened to be right in the middle of a fish farming area. Uh, we never did see that DFO scientist after he made those comments. Right now, when I look at the young fry, I catch them with the beach chain, collect them, look at them alive. When I look at them leaving the Broughton Archipelago, over 90% are lethally infected with sea lice. And so this alone is wiping out the Broughton stocks. It's also occurring in Clockwood Sound. It's occurring around Campbell River. It's occurring in Norway, Scotland, Ireland. It's occurred everywhere so there's fish farms. The impacts of salmon farming on their surrounding ecosystems also extend beyond the sea lice they breed by the billions. In a failed attempt to stop the spread of lice, the industry has created new problems by feeding the fish a neurotoxin that goes by the brand name Slice. Now the remedy that's being talked about is a chemical uh, treatment, emamectin benzoate, a, a chemical that's fed to the fish, and it's a, um, it's a, it's a crustacean neurotoxin, so lice are a crustacean, uh, but now so are crabs and plankton and shrimp and prawns and so on. A lot of it goes out into the environment. What kind of impacts are, the, are, are something like that having on these other components of the ecosystem? There's a lot of issues with slice. First of all, it doesn't work. It, it, it reduces the lice for a little while, but there's always a few fish in the pens that don't eat the drug, and then the lice live on those fish, and as soon as the drug wears off, broop, the lice come back. Second of all, it's not approved for use in the marine environment. Uh, it hasn't gone through the drug testing programs that uh, drugs have to go through in Canada to be used like this. The farming industry also produces and discharges tons of fecal waste and chemicals directly into the ocean. What we're finding is a decline in virtually every marine species in our territory. Uh, we're finding things such as clams that were once bright and pink and very appealing to finding ones that are black. And yet we have the rhetoric from the government and the rhetoric from industry is that there's no impacts beyond uh, the cages themselves. At the heart of the salmon farming catastrophe is a conflict between science and the power of denial. You know, in the end, I sent 10,000 pages of letter to government and never got a direct response. But I finally realized that what they were saying was there's no evidence. They had no evidence of disease transfer. They didn't say there was no disease transfer. They just said there's no evidence. So I decided to collect the evidence and publish it in the best journals that I could find. When I first reported the lice to them, they said, oh, could you go get us some? And then when I did that, they said, you know, you're fishing without a permit and you could go to jail for that. These papers are, are peer-reviewed, highly respected journal papers, and they're all saying, look, it, we're doing something wrong there. There are problems there. And, and so I'm really deeply disturbed that, that the government is in denial. The, the level of proof they're requiring for this is, 
is just damn nonsensical. If DFO had the precautionary principle that if they paid any heed to it, then they would be backing away. The research products that uh, have now come together and speak as a single voice in, in the determination that the salmon farms are a legitimate threat to wild salmon populations appear in the world's most uh, prestigious academic journals and as such go through the most rigorous examination that the scientific community can muster as opposed to the rebuttal to these, uh, these papers which appear in letters to the editor of newspapers or are simply published on you know, industry or government web pages. Former senior scientist and manager from Fisheries and Oceans Canada, otherwise known as DFO, Otto Langer resigned from the government after a 32-year career over its refusal to deal with these obvious threats to wild salmon. They will be infected and many of them will die. It's that simple. And to deny that simple uh, linkage is unbelievable. I left fisheries in great disillusionment in 2002 and I have seen no improvement. Uh, there's a great conflict of interest within that agency. They are promoting fish farming, and yet they have the Fisheries Act, which says they have to conserve and protect fish habitat and protect wild fish. So why are governments, you know, decided to go forward with this kind of thing? Uh, it's, it's, um, it's completely insane. With each passing season, the plight of wild salmon worsens as it does for all who depend upon them for sustenance and employment. Reports of fewer sightings of grizzlies, eagles, and orca are now common throughout Canada's coast. The economic impacts have been particularly devastating for the few low-paying local jobs generated by the largely foreign-owned farming industry. Thousands of jobs in other salmon-dependent industries are at serious risk. New voices from commercial and native fisheries, sport fishing guides, and the ecotourism industry are added every day to the growing chorus of outrage. Salmon farming is definitely seen as a threat by most every fishing guide that I know, many commercial fishermen, and lots of the ecotourism operators. As a leader of a First Nation, we need to have a look and plan for the future for our next generations. And I know when we start to think in those terms, even the uh, incremental impacts that we're seeing now are unacceptable. If wild salmon are to be saved, it's clear what must be done. The good old days of planting fish farms all along the coast with open neck technology using an exotic species is over. So let's turn the page and start all over and do it properly this time. There are some viable alternatives, such as closed containment farms, separating the farm fish from the wild fish. If we did have to accept salmon farms, the technology would have to be very different. Uh, they'd have to be closed systems, not these open net cages where the fish can escape, the feces and everything can settle on the ocean bottom, the sea lice can get out, get out of the cages and attack wild fish. That has simply has to change. That's archaic and unacceptable technology in this century. Some operators have seen the writing on the wall and have begun the transition to closed containment systems on their own accord. We began to realize that uh, really protecting the environment was a, a positive um, economic benefit to us as well. It, things like um, uh, losses of salmon through, through holes in the nets, if we could avoid that, we'd avoid losing money. We could be quite competitive and, and in fact uh, uh, possibly have lower production costs. While they've demonstrated the practice is essentially economically feasible, leaving no excuses for the large industry holdouts, the B.C. government hasn't exactly been rolling out the red carpet for them. It's been an expensive and long process and uh, um, we find it very interesting that the, the provincial government has stayed away from um, any involvement in, in, from a financial perspective in, in innovative design of, of new technologies. Whatever the future of the industry, it must be one that does not generate false profits by externalizing its costs on a society and the environment. The lice, the waste, the chemicals from farms are harming tourism and fishing industries in coastal communities and the fish and wildlife who depend upon these ecosystems. Open cage operations produce a cheaper product by offloading these costs and impacts onto others and that is what has to change. I think what is happening is the, the, the truth is starting to be un unveiled. It's a sad history that's happened all around the world in Norway, Scotland, Ireland, Chile and why we accepted this in British Columbia is, is almost unfathomable. You know, people come from these other countries and they say, 
Don't you read? And don't you read the scientific information? In any event, it's clear that for the industry, and much more importantly for wild salmon of BC's coastal communities to survive, there must be an immediate change from the status quo, which is killing wild salmon. We need people to revolt and, and actually say, enough is enough. We need to do something about this before it's too late. How we deal with this crisis, whether we allow reason to prevail over greed and denial, will be the ultimate measure of our environmental stewardship and of us as a people. This is about saving wild salmon and everything that depends upon them, our economies, communities, wildlife, and some of the most spectacular places on Earth. If the fish farms were shut down tomorrow, there'd be an instantaneous rebound in the pink salmon. There are two-year fish. The chums would take three to five years, the Chinook would take longer, but I have no doubt the system would rebuild itself almost immediately. <laughs>